Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What's up, William? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And I want to thank you. And I, I want to thank whoever drafted the city charter for getting us out early on this chilly New Year's Day. So thank you for that. Um, I want to thank President Lee Pelton and Emerson and everyone at Emerson College for hosting us today. Thank you, Mr. President. You were great. <laughs> Vice President Biden, thank you for your kind words, for your service to our country, and for your example of compassionate leadership and uncommon strength at a time when we surely need it. So thank you, Mr. Vice President. <laughs> to my family, and there's a lot here, I love you. Uh, I love you, Mom. I love you, Laurie. And thank you for always being by my side. I love you, John. Um, and my aunts and uncles. Governor Baker, Speaker DeLeo, Senator Maki, Congressman Capuano, Congressman Lynch, uh, Attorney General Healy, Ambassador Flynn, uh, all the elected officials and appointed officials that are here, good morning. And thank you all for being here with us this morning. To the members of the Boston City Council, especially Councilors Lydia Edwards, Kim Janey, and Ed Flynn, welcome and congratulations to you and your families. And I look forward to working with all of you as we move Boston's future forward, so thank you very much. For the, to the first responders who worked late last night to keep us safe, as they do every night and every day, and to all of our city workers that are out there today, I want to say thank you as well for the great work you do. And to the people of Boston, the women and men, the children and seniors, the workers in every industry, the small business owners in every neighborhood, the artists and the activists, the clergy and the social workers, the teachers and the students, the veterans who protect us and make us proud, I wish each of you and your families a happy and healthy New Year as we move forward. So thank you. Since 1630, Boston has been a refuge from religious persecution, from hunger and war and discrimination, and now also from climate change. From the first immigrants who set foot on the Shaman Peninsula to the first students from Puerto Rico who stepped in a new classroom this fall. For nearly four centuries, Boston has been more than a place we share. It's been a hope that we bring. It's the determination that we show. It's the idea that Boston and America were built on. That if we listen to the truth, if we learn from our past, and if we lead in a spirit of service, that each generation can do better than the last in fairness and goodness as well as, as, well as in health and prosperity, and we can be a power of example to the nation and the rest of the world. Over the last four years, we've dedicated ourselves together to Boston's progress. In a city where free public education began, we expanded this reach from pre-kindergarten to community college. We tackled the housing shortage by building a record number of new homes and new affordable homes. We showed a way forward in police community relations. Major crime has fallen by 19% and arrests are down by 23%. We prove that Boston's value create value, adding 80,000 new jobs, lifting small businesses in neighborhoods, and becoming a headquarter city in the global economy. With the new revenue from our growth and by modernizing city government, we've upgraded our schools, our parks, our libraries, our community centers, and all of these neighborhoods that the people in our neighborhoods cherish. At a time when the national conversation too often turned mean, we, cre we recommit ourselves without reservation to feeding the hungry, housing the homeless, confronting racism, and welcoming the immigrant, and we always will. We are a proud city, but like many good Bostonians, we are not satisfied with the progress of yesterday. We know that there is much more work to be done. 
In 12 short years, Boston will churn 400. Whatever I'm doing in 2030, I want us to know that we did everything we could to make Boston better and make Boston stronger. That's why we worked together so much on planning in the last four years. And it's why we called it Imagine Boston 2030. We want to finish Boston's fourth century stronger and more united than ever. We want to take our city to new heights, but to do that, we must adapt to the idea of Boston to new challenges from local streets to the global stage. We can be a city whose industry and innovation make the world a better place and provide good jobs in every neighborhood of Boston. We can be a city that heals the environment by opening our waterfront for all to enjoy. We can be a global capital of learning whose own young people know that they can change the world. In other words, we can be the city that's world class because it works for the middle class. That's what made the idea of Boston a reality for most of us. As you know, my parents came here as immigrants with next to nothing. My father got a job helping to build Boston's growing skyline. He and my mother were able to make a home to raise their two sons to dream even bigger dreams. That's the kind of progress a strong middle class provides. Not just security for those who are already comfortable, but opportunity for all those who need it. My greatest concern for our city's future is that we could lose this engine of upward mobility. Nationwide, fewer than half of the workers born in the 1980s are earning as much as their parents did. Something has gone wrong. It's not just globalization and technology. We've faced upheavals before, like depression and war, and we've come out even stronger. Today, instead of coming together to defend our common welfare, we are divided and our middle class is under attack. Progress on health care is getting rolled back. Taxes are shifting from the wealthy onto the backs of the working people. And there's talks of cutting Social Security and Medicare for our seniors. We see attacks on workers' rights, on women and immigrant and people of color who make up the majority of our working class city. These are efforts to break up and tear down the middle class that built America's prosperity and is building Boston's future. That's why we have stood up to fight back and we have to keep fighting back. But just as important, we have to show a way forward. In my second term, I will prioritize the fundamentals of the middle class opportunity in our world class city. Strong 21st century schools, good jobs, affordable homes in safe neighborhoods, a better Boston for everyone. It begins with a guarantee that every child, whatever their starting point, gets the education they need to thrive. This is a promise this we must keep together as a community by listening to and working with families, teachers, and principals. That's how we are going to revitalize Boston's aging school infrastructure through Build BPS, our $1 billion facility program. Our progress so far has shown the range of diverse communities and student needs and 21st century skills that a new building can unlock. We started with a brand new Dearborn STEM Academy in Roxbury. It's Boston's first high school in nearly 23 years. Next, Next up is a state-of-the-art new school for Boston Arts Academy in the Fenway area. And we are moving forward with a new building for our International Quincy Upper School in Chinatown. And we're going to rebuild the Carter School in the South End, serving students with the most profound special needs. Our plan is to triple their capacity, install a therapeutic pool for this compassionate gem of a school community. And just as important as our new buildings are our innovation. At the David Ellis School in Roxbury, the McKay School in East Boston, the Channing Elementary in High Park, the Condon School in South Boston, the Curley School in Jamaica Plain, and many, many more. So I want to thank all those schools. In the next four years, we're going to continue build PPS by working with school communities towards simpler grade configurations that work better for everyone. 
We're also going to scale up our new food pilot program that's working at East Boston High School, the Kennedy School, the Bradley School, and East Boston's Early Learning Center until every single student in our district gets two fresh, nutritious meals every single day. As we modernize our infrastructure, we're going to continue to strengthen the academic pathways to every single grade. By turning education into opportunity, it goes well beyond the school walls. Our young people need and deserve access to the global network of, network of learning that flows through our city. We'll be calling Boston's world-renowned colleges and universities to help us play a bigger role. In 2016, we can clap for this, in 2016, <laughs> 710 residents were attending private colleges in our city on scholarships worth nearly $32 million. That's a 14% increase from four years earlier. And I want to thank all of these institutions, these college universities. But in particular, I want to thank Boston University for enrolling 80 new BPS grads this year alone. But I also ask our college universities, as good citizens, to do more. Come into more of our schools. Admit more of our graduates. And by next year, I challenge all of you as a community to add 100 new full scholarships for Boston students in our city. Finally, when leadership from the White House is lacking, our partnership with the State House is more important than ever. Nowhere has that partnership had more of an impact than on our classrooms. But our success was built on a two-part agreement, accountability and funding. And while student outcomes have kept improving, funding shortfalls are undermining our ability to go further. So we continue to advocate for fully funding charter school reimbursement called for by state law. And we will keep, And we will keep working with the legislature on our plan to fund universal pre-kindergarten with tourism taxes that are already being collected in the city of Boston. <laughs> Education has evolved. It's time for our partnership to evolve as well. Let's pull together to move our students, our city, and our state forward. And we need real pathways to lead real opportunity. That means good jobs that sustain families and strengthen our middle class. Four years ago, we created an economic development cabinet to unify and strengthen our job-creating policies. This team has expanded small business supports in every neighborhood, has recruited industry leaders from around the world to bring new jobs to our city, and moved Bostonians up into the middle class careers. Our Office of Workforce Development has trained nearly 3,000 Bostonians for good jobs with living wages. It's empowered thousands more with credit and wealth building tools. And now we're building a program called City Academy to train and place Boston Public School grads in good city jobs. In the next, in the next four years, we will go further with a campaign called Boston Hires. We will work at nonprofit partners and private employers towards a new goal. 20,000 low-income Boston residents trained and placed in good jobs by the year 2030. I invite all of our city employers to join this movement and take advantage of this tremendous untapped talent in our neighborhoods. A strong education and a good job are the foundation, but housing is the key to long-term financial security. Four years ago, we took on a historic housing shortage that has been driving up costs and driving down savings for far too many families. We set a target of creating 53,000 units of new homes by the year 2030. By improving the development and permitting process, increasing affordable and housing production, and expanding home buyer supports, we got ahead of pace to meet this goal, and we have seen rent stabilize. Last year alone, we set a new record with over 5,000 new homes and more than 1,000 restricted to low and moderate income families. But, but our city's population is growing even faster, and a regional housing shortage is adding pressure. Too many families are still being priced out of too many neighborhoods. We are determined to meet this challenge by redoubling our efforts. Recently, I stood with mayors from across the uh, greater Boston 
to commit to a regional housing plan. By March, we will announce the number of new homes that the region needs. As a leader of this strategy, we will increase our city's targets for low-income homes, moderate income homes, and senior housing, and overall units. We will meet these goals by following your vision in Imagine Boston 2030. Transit-oriented development, mixed income growth in new neighborhoods, protecting and enhancing our existing communities. We will draw on new resources for the affordable housing from the Community Preservation Act, which you supported. And to serve those in the greatest needs, we'll also invest in public housing like never before. In college enrollment, as college enrollment increases, we will insist on new dorms that leave more neighborhood homes for our people and our communities. With new targets driving us forward, a regional housing plan from our neighbors and help from our neighbors, and the state legislature working on a housing bond, we all recommit to making affordable homes a reality for a strong middle class. Every single person deserves security, dignity, and hope. Those suffering from addiction and those experiencing homelessness are no less deserving than anyone of a place in our middle class community. In 2014, for the safety of our most vulnerable residents, we were forced to close the Long Island Bridge. At the same time, we opened the door to long overdue reforms in how Boston provides human service for our region. I want to make one thing clear. The opioid crisis and homelessness are not the same. They each require a comprehensive response. That's why we created an Office of Recovery Services to expand access to treatment. Recovery requires a continuum of care, from detox to residential treatment to transitional housing to reclaim your life. For many people, including myself, Long Island played a vital role in Boston's landscape, and it will again. I pledge to you today that we are and we will rebuild the bridge back to Long Island. And we will create on Long Island the comprehensive long-term recovery campus that our city and our state needs now more than ever to tackle the opioid crisis. The closing of Long Island did something else. It finally brought homelessness out of the shadows. Instead of riding, out to, riding on a bus out to a shelter night after night for months and years on end, people need a permanent home which supports as part of a community. They need housing first. That's the system we are moving towards. It's how we've housed nearly 1,300 formerly homeless people already in the city of Boston, and it's how we've ended chronic veterans homelessness, a challenge that Vice President Biden and President Obama gave the city of Boston. So we ended that in our city. But the need remains great. So today, we embark together on a citywide movement. We launched the Boston Way Homes Fund. Our goal is to raise $10 million privately to create 200 units of permanent, supporting ho permanent supportive housing over the next four years. <laughs> Pine Street Inn will provide the know-how, and Bank of America will start us off with a quarter of a million dollar donation. I'd like to thank Ann Finucan and Michal Chamberlain of Bank of America for your leadership. And I invite every organization and individual to join us. And I ask everyone here or watching at home, visit bostonswayhomefund.org and learn how you can help. That's bostonswayhomefund.org. Boston built America's first public school, public park, and public library. We dug the first subway, invented the first telephone, and we ran the first annual marathon, and we won the first World Series. <laughs> now, now let's be the first major city to come together as a community and end chronic homelessness for good. From around the world and across our nation, people look to Boston for hope, for opportunity, for a chance to build a better life. They make Boston their home. They become our middle class. They are us. 
And together, we live the idea that is Boston, the beating heart of a great city that is always moving forward. Today, we take another step forward together, mindful of our history as a city of purpose and progress, optimistic about our future, and determined to fulfill a vision that grows with each generation. We are more than a city on a hill with the eyes of the world upon us. We are a city built by all the people of the world as they turn hunger into hope, crisis into recovery, conflict into community. We are a city of neighborhoods that care, a city of second chances, a city of learning and healing, a city of courage and creativity, of heart and hope. We are one of the greatest cities of the world, and after nearly four centuries, our greatest days are yet to come. I want to thank you for being here this morning. God bless you. God bless the city of Boston.